It was time for the Passover meal, Jesus' last Passover meal before going to the cross. And as we know in the culture during Jesus' day, it was custom for the servants of the house to wash the feet of those guests. Why? Because they were dirty. As they came into the home and wherever they had secured, secured to have this meal, there was a lesson to be taught to the disciples that night about service, love, and humility. The story starts in John 13, where we're told about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And Peter wanted nothing to do with that. Have you ever been a part of a foot washing ceremony? There's always that person like, Ugh, not me, not me, you can't do that, not me. How would you feel if Jesus says, hey, I'm going to wash your feet today? And be like, uh, okay, go ahead. I, get, I mean, you're Jesus, so you do what you want. But... Peter wanted nothing to do with it. How could Jesus, the Messiah, be allowed to wash my feet? But Jesus did just that. Both the act of washing someone else's feet and having your feet washed lends itself to humility. It is a kind of awkwardness and uncomfortableness that just fills the room when those things happen. In Luke 22, 24, we read that right after... Uh, right before the meal took place, that Judas had agreed to betray Jesus, and then they presumably all have their feet washed. They eat the Passover meal, and then Jesus tells them that one of them will betray him. The disciples, you'd think, would have been humbled by the act of service and remembering the Passover meal, that they would question who would do such a thing, but then almost immediately they begin arguing over who would be the greatest among them. Judas betrays Jesus, then he leaves, and it's John 13, in verse 31, tells us that as Judas left the room, Jesus shares a reminder of what will be the mark of greatness as a follower of his. John 13, 33, dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. This didn't sound like a suggestion. He says, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. In verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus was saying, it isn't about who does the most. It isn't about who is the best spoken. It isn't about who knows the most. It isn't about who serves the most, who helps the most. Yes, those things matter. And we're doing those things for Jesus. But Jesus reminds the disciples who were with him for years. What really matters is that you love each other as much as I have loved you. How well do we love each other? How well we love each other will be a mark of being a follower of Jesus. Of being a disciple of Jesus. So church, how well are we loving each other and those around us? Is your relationship with Jesus helping you to love those around you more and more each day? In the book of Matthew 23, we find Jesus just lighting up the Pharisees. He is just lighting them up. The Pharisees were the best at keeping. The, they were just, they were, they were it. They were, they were the best at jumping through all the religious hoops. And they thought in doing so that they could find righteousness. Then this interaction with Jesus happens. And Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you several times. And it shines a light on their hyper focus on external religious activity. And they're ignoring the internal mess of their hearts. Church, this morning, I want to talk about the internal mess of our hearts. If we are claiming to be a follower of Jesus and we're not loving those around us. We would never. But Jesus says in Matthew 23 and verse 25, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. God help us. Hypocrites, he calls them. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you, inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first you wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. Verse 27, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but inside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurities. Outward, oh, outward you look righteous, you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. 
I'm not standing up here today because I'm perfect. I'm standing up here today because we have a message from the Lord that says we do not need to look righteous on the outside, but be filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness on the inside. I thought today, Pastor Andy, was all about love. I was expecting you to start off this thing with funny love songs and share a whole list of them. I've done that before. Share the warm and fuzzies with us about love, but I'll get there, but it won't be so warm and fuzzy. Why? Because I'm fearful this morning that we get so caught up in being good Christians, but we fail to be defined by what Jesus said we should be known for. It should be sobering to think that we could be good at being a Christian and fail to love as we're called to love. C.S. Lewis writes in The Great Divorce, he says this, There have been men before who got so interested in proving the existence of God that they came to care nothing for God himself. As if the good Lord had nothing to do but to exist. There have been some who were so preoccupied with spreading Christianity that they never gave a thought to Christ. Church, we must be ever so mindful that we never have a religion that finds itself religiously busy but failing to love God and others. Why? Because Paul writes this very thing. 1 Corinthians 13, we know this passage. We're going to hang out there a little bit today. Starting in verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would be only a noising gong or clanging cymbal. Should I go get the cymbals? Oh, I'm not a youth pastor anymore, so I don't get to do things like that. <laughs> I could go over to the drum set, but it wouldn't have the same effect. It'd be like it. Never, keep. <laughs> Says if I had all the languages of the earth and, and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understand all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, it says, what? I would be nothing? If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. A religion without love at the center is noisy, empty, and gaining nothing. I didn't say it. Noisy gong. The sound of... Of a roaring sea. And you, like that, get those drummers over there. They just love their, 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 their cymbals. And they're just like. And they just keep going. And they're like just stop. Clanging cymbals. Just repetitive loud noises. And all the drummers are like. Wait, wait until next week. <laughs> <laughs> all of those things. Mean nothing if we don't do it with love. Jesus told us what the greatest commandment was. It was to love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. When our religion or religious activities or what we view as righteous leads us to do anything other than to love others, church, we are missing the mark. When we are good at church but fail to be the hands and feet of the church, God help us. When we mistakenly allow religious activity to be the focus of our love instead of the savior of our souls, God help us. Listen this morning, I'm not saying just go crazy and you'll have to do anything. Like, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. All these religious, I'm, I'm, when, we, when we talk about religious activities of what? Praying, reading the Bible, all coming to church, going to Bible studies, all these serving, all these things. Those are not bad. But if we worship them, they're bad. If we are not worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords through those things and our heart isn't pointed where it should be pointed and we have no love for those around us. The Bible says we don't have anything. The question this morning is how well are we loving others? To have a big love as God longs for us to have, we must not have religion without love. This is why we talk all the time about relationship over religion. God sending Jesus for you and I was a relational act, not a religious one. It was a relational act that he sent Jesus to die for you. Why? So he could come and help you live this life out. Because it's tough. I'm not, si- I'm not sitting up here and saying, well, you, you got to do all these. No, it, it's God in us. We do all these things. We read our Bible. We pray. We go to Bible studies. We do all these things. And God works through us to love others. But if it's not doing that, something is wrong. Because that's the point. To love God with everything we have and to love our neighbors ourselves. That's the point. That's how people will know that we're, we're Christians. How well are we loving others today? 
Love moves us to action. God is love. Love comes from God. And it was love that brought Jesus to earth. We know John 3.16. For God so loved. For God so loved that he gave Jesus that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved. He moves out of love because God is love. And we wouldn't know love without knowing God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you thankful for the love that God has shown to you up to this point? (laughs) Aren't you thankful this morning? I know, I need affirmation. Let me take a drink. I'll read it again, like I'll just rewind. Aren't you thankful for the love that God has shown to you up to this point? Where would we be without that love? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of our God today in that he is patient with us. I don't know about you. I'll speak for myself. If God wasn't patient with me, we would be nowhere. I'm thankful this morning that he can forgive me, that when we mess up, that when we lose our stuff and we get angry and that when something bad happens and we doubt and question him, that when we talk and just walk through grief and and loss and our hearts just are broken from the loneliness and the sadness and we wonder if this ache will ever go away, even then in those moments of doubt and fear and frustration, God loves us. With all that said, I wonder this morning, Are there hurting, upset, angry, and sinful people in your life that you need to show love to today? Are there people in your life that you don't agree with politically that you need to show love to today? Ooh. Ouch. (laughs) I'll scoot over here. Are there people morally that aren't on the right path? And they know it, you know it, that you need to love today. Pastor Andy, what if showing them kindness leads them to think that I approve or I agree? It will make me look weak. It will make God look bad. (laughs) We need to show them tough love. We need to show them what God hates. Well, for God so loved the world. You think that you showing love is is a weakness? That's a trick of the enemy. You think that you showing love is is, is going to make people think, oh, I don't really, where do you stand? That's a trick of the enemy. We are called to love people. For God so loved, let's not forget the next verse. God sent his son into the world, world, John 3, 17. Not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. But they'll know we're disciples of Jesus by our love. That doesn't mean we approve of what people do. It doesn't mean that Jesus approved of people that that he visited and all the people that that he interacted with. But I believe that being around Jesus transforms our life. And if it doesn't, something is wrong. But the world is so dark and there's so many things that our culture says that, that go against our beliefs. And just so much love them anyway. The love of God shines brighter than any darkness on this world. There isn't a thing that you can see, watch, hear about, that people can write, songs, whatever it is. There's nothing that the love of God is not more powerful than. Church, I believe that if the church can love those around it, Jesus will transform the lives of those around us. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Can you imagine that? Is there anyone in your life that may have betrayed you or eventually cause your death and you're okay with washing their feet this morning? Like, come on, betrayer. Let me, probably not, right? No one, no one would know that. Then if we don't have those people in our life, tell me, who is too tough for you to show love to this morning? Who in your life can you show a radical act of love towards, even though they will never show you love in return? We don't love others with a goal in mind or just looking for that that affirmation, like someone who keeps saying amen all the time. 
for that reciprocity. That isn't love. Love is not self-seeking. We love others because the God of the universe who created you and created those around you, his spirit lives inside of us. And when you love others, you are showing them that God is love. Loving God and others is our mission on earth. How do we do it? Glad you asked. Donna nailed that this morning with that box of chocolates. And she didn't say, come get chocolates for your kids. Did you hear what she said? If we rewind it, she said, parents, come up and get chocolate. Okay. <laughs> First Corinthians 13. We've heard this time after time after time after time. You know what? I'm praying over the next few minutes that as, as I preach this, that God would just stick something in your brain and not let you get away from it. There's something in here that I guarantee most of us, if we're going to be real honest with, us, with, with, each, with each other and ourselves, that we struggle with. How do we love God and love others? That's our mission. Right. Let's read it. Love is patient. Starting off with a zinger. <laughs> Couldn't he start it somewhere else? <sighs> love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. We're going to come back to all these, so don't think I'm skipping them. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. How do we show that we're followers of Jesus? We have to be patient. I don't know who said it, but somebody said it. They said, you should never pray for patience. I don't know who said that, but I don't know that they were a believer. Oof. Because I'm pretty sure love, joy, and peace, patience is a, is a fruit of the Spirit. Have you prayed for the fruit of the Spirit in your life? That God would grow those things? Just not that one. <laughs> We are patient. When we are patient with people, when we're slow to punish people, when we're slow to seek revenge, when we endure troubles and deal patiently with troubling people, we're showing the love of God to others. And when we don't, now hear me, I'm not up here saying that. I've got all these covered and it's like, we're, the staff of Lifeway have all of these things down and we're great. At, I'm telling you, we struggle with these things. That's why we're talking about it this morning. If you have people in your life that you know test your patience, why are you not packing more patience before you start interacting with him? And asking, going into it and saying, God, you know, this person drives me crazy. This person, this or that, this person, the pay, my patience with them is very thin. But we go into it and we're like, uh, and we, we fail to realize that we're showing them love. They'll know we're Christians by our love and being patient with people is what God's word says love is. Take it or leave it. Just saying. I'm not great, so don't complain to me. It's in scripture. I wish it said something else, but it doesn't. Why? Because being patient is a supernatural thing. It is a countercultural thing that is stark, in stark contrast to the people around you who have no patience, who are always in a hurry, who are always pressured, who are always, blah, 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 blah. I gotta go, gotta go. That's why it shows people love. Are we known this morning as a kind people? Not harsh, not too spicy. And let me take this st a step further. Are we known to be kind outside of these walls? I've met some mean Christians, but usually not on a Sunday morning. Are we kind? Are we kind to people that we interact with? Are we patient? Are we kind with them? Are you known as a kind person? Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's pr not proud, not rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Other versions say it's not easily angered. I like that a little bit better because I get irrit irritated all the time. If we're making decisions based out of anger, they rarely end up well. I cannot tell you the number of messages or posts or texts that I have grown to delete and or send to my wife, not about her, <laughs> like my angry text, blah. 
But no, I, I send it to her. Why? And, and Rick and I have talked many times about this, about how, using the, 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 the marriage relationship and we have wives that we can have the, them filter things for us. Because when we act out of anger, it rarely ends up well. It rarely ends up like we want it to. Why? Because it, it is easy to get offended and irritated and angered if our hearts are not pointed towards God and towards love. I saw after a certain team uh, lost a playoff game a couple weeks ago, a lot of their team's fans were breaking TVs. I won't say who they were. I won't say who the, who the team was. But I only broke one thing watching an IU basketball game. It was a clothes hamper in college. <laughs> just got really mad and then just like, shwack. And I taped it up just to remind me not to get angry again. And it sat there until I think I got, I think when we got married, it, I still had it. And it was like really, it was like cracked and like dangerous and sharp and pointy. But tape everywhere. Here's the thing. When we act out of anger, those decisions rarely produce anything good. It says love does not act out of anger. Acting out of anger leads to nowhere good. And it, love keeps no record of being wrong. It keeps no record of wrongs. Can you imagine keeping a Google sheet or spreadsheet, Google sheet, of all the things that someone's done to you? Some of you are like, I got it on my phone. <laughs> we don't do that, though, right, as Christians? We don't, we don't keep a list of all the people that have, that have said something to us and hurt us and, and been mean to us. And that lady that was at that one, that one place, and she was just so rude. Wait till I go back there. She's not getting a tip next time. Wait a minute. Love keeps no record of wrongs? Mm. If you're married, I don't even need to tell you about that. Like, do not keep a record of wrong. It's not going to lead anywhere good. Why do we do that? Because it's easy to stay hurt and to hold on to things. It's much easier than to show love by not remembering and not holding on to those things. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. This simply means that love does not delight when bad things happen to people you don't like or even people you think deserve it. Because God's love never delights in anything evil. Some people got, I won't even go there. This is, what, this is what we're called to be known by is love. So if you see something happen to somebody and there's this little part in you that is a little happy about it, they get what they deserve. The Bible says that that's not love. And we're called to be known by our love. How are you doing with that this morning? Colossians 3, 12, it says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Man, that should be the verse of 2023. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's not an option, as Pastor Rick said. And then above all else, clothe yourself with love, which binds us to all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. This love that we're told, to, told by Jesus to, to be known for, and that is defined in the passage we just read, that we're called to clothe ourselves with. It isn't easy and it's going to take some time, but our love as a believer needs to grow up. Why do I say that? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. It, sound, it, it seems you read the passage that Paul is given this wonderful message, and then he just goes off on this rabbit trail. He's talking about love, and then all of a sudden, he says, When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And I know now... All that I know now is, is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Albert Tate said in a message that we heard at the gathering, that in this passage, that Paul is defining love in action. And then in verse 11 comes, and, it, and it's not a rabbit trail, but it's a realization to us this morning that we are called to maturity in Christ. And this means that we're called 
to mature in how we love others. When I was, I'm glad, I'm glad not everybody watches the live feeds like my mom or dad, because sometimes I talk about mess, uh, them in the message. But my dad, if you've ever met him, has a really long nose. Children's Sunday, I should have watched that one. <laughs> Let me write that down. My dad has a really an abnormally long nose. I don't know why. When I was a kid, I prayed many, many times. God, I don't want to look like my dad. <laughs> it was like, hold on to my nose. I do not want to look like my dad. Lord, please. I'm not asking for much. I just do not want to have that nose. I don't want to look like my dad. However, I believe here the author is reminding us that when we uh, grow in knowledge, when we grow in wisdom, as we do these religious things that are not bad, like I said, but can't be the end goal and end purpose, we must love in ways that make us look like the Father. When I was a child, I was patient like a child. When I was a child, I had, ki- had the kindness of a child. When I was a child, I kept a record of all the wrongs and was easily angered and envy and was boastful, all like a child. But when I grew up, or better yet, when Christ got a hold of my life and his spirit was placed in my life, I put away those childish things. I never wanted to look like my dad and have his nose. But church, when we love in this way, when our love starts to mature, we start looking like, like Jesus who looks like God. We start to look like our father in heaven. And I don't know about you, but I desperately long to act and speak and listen and love like my father in heaven. Do you want to love like your father in heaven? As I don't have enough patience. I don't have enough kindness. I don't have enough last nerves for people to get on in my own strength to have people see Jesus in me. Church, I hope this morning you don't walk out of here and you're like, well, Pastor Andy gave me a checklist and I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to be kinder and all the, oh, oh, more patient. <laughs> if you try to do those things without the power of the Holy Spirit, it will not work. We are spirit led that's what we're talking about it isn't just like we we do all these things and it's a nice word up there we believe that to live this life out to love like god longs for us to love we have to be spirit led and if you are not and god asking god to fill you up with his spirit it's not ever going to be enough it's not going to be what we do. We, we do all these things to put ourselves in the position to be more spirit-led. We read and pray and, and have Bible studies and become worship. And we do all that we serve. We do all these things so that God's spirit would, would continue to fill us up as we do these things. Jesus came to serve, so we serve. He does all of these different things, but those aren't the purpose. The purpose is to love God, to love others. 1 John 4. As the band comes this morning, 1 John 4, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has seen, ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Let's pray.